sector folks to participate in in this seminar series. And so today, today we are going to hear from Griffin and specifically Matt Bechtel. And so Griffin is a company that that has developed a hardware and software solution to acquire high resolution multimodal data in uh, different sorts of either agricultural or natural ecosystem contexts. And so um, it's a bit of a unique solution, we believe. And so what is Griffin? Griffin is a company that was actually founded at Purdue University by a handful of, of professors. I think I'm the only one that's sitting in the room here today. I just wanted to let you know that I'm actually a founder of Griffin. So I'm making, I mean, we were, I talked to Matt a little bit about what sort of kind of context might he provide in terms of of information that would be useful to this group. And I think he's come up with a really nice presentation around the value proposition of high resolution multimodal data. So Matt, thank you so much for coming here and tell, telling us a little bit about the Griffin story today. Thank you. So appreciate the the, the time. Um, if, if you've got questions, there are other people on campus you can talk about too. Um, you can talk to Dr. Yang about the, the platforms that we've got out that are flying out of Acre. You've got students. We, we work really hard given this technology commercialization kind of conflict of interest process to keep Dr. Teinstra and the founders separate and Purdue work and commercial work separate. So we have customers on campus that you can talk to and, and, and they can give you all the details that you want. Um, I, I went back and looked at a few of these kind of recordings that you've done in the past to get, just to get some context. And I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm feeling a little awkward coming at it from the commercial side of things. Uh, I don't, I don't want this to be a commercial. Uh, I want to talk about why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the philosophies that we've had and how we've tried to commercialize these kinds of technologies, specifically for research, uh, in terms of this whole idea of big data. It's a little bit of uh, clickbait. It's really about better data. You know, and and what is that, and what does that mean, and 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 for the research community especially. Um, so we have a, a unique kind of role, a unique kind of background. So I want to focus more of that story around why do we do the things that we do? What, what's the rationale? Where do we try to bring value to Dr. Teinstra's point in this community? Much more than a technical description, or much more than a pitch of why us versus somebody else. It's it's really not about that. Um, and, and before I kind of jump into this, you know, we'll, we'll have kind of maybe three major sections. The, the first is just, again, just to kind of set some stage around what are the questions we're asking? Who, who is Griffin and, and why did we start doing the things that we did um, with the Purdue faculty? But then the, how did we start to, to really focus on, well, what are the problems that we can solve for a larger community? Um, and, and then we'll kind of come back to some of the, the trends that we're seeing and we can open it up for, for some Q&A. The, the, the first caveat I'll put out there, though, is that you know I'm, my background is really public affairs and applied science. I am not a traditional hard science background. I don't have an engineering background. You know, my my role has been really in how do you bring technologies together? How do you bring disparate people and approaches together to try to provide solutions? So this is very personal for me in terms of what we do at Griffin. And, and the reason is, you know, starting a little bit of a, a foreshadowing in terms of telling you the, the, the story. Uh, so I was in graduate school and had the, the lucky opportunity to get with the folks at the Goddard Space Flight Center who were doing early hyperspectral analysis in agriculture. Um, and that was in 1998, so 25 years ago. Um, and what we were doing is we were flying one of those original Original was called ASA at the time. I think I still actually use that acronym with Speckum, the hyperspectral company out of Finland, if you know them. You know, we were using airplanes, we were coordinating things, we were dealing with early GPS. It was really pushing the envelope. Well, we had literally um, 256 Pentium processors all strung together to try to do early co cloud compute, you know, in one machine and send those things over wireless cards. We were out of our minds, but it was amazing what in terms of what we were trying to do, because we knew it was expensive. We knew it was, it was prohibitive for anybody to really do that. But we saw the future of, OK, we're starting to see a lot of imagery in agriculture. We're starting to see a lot of spatial analysis in agriculture. We're starting to see those same tools in uh, environmental science, in forestry and natural resources. But are they economical? How do they work? So it was three years of basically a lot of frustration. 
Um, when you talk about big data at the time, I literally had to put in a, a special request to get a CD burner. We were still using reel-to-reel -reel tape for a lot of our data storage. That was not that long ago. Um, and so when I talk about now that Griffin in the last couple of years, we've collected almost 30 terabytes of just raw data. It's a very different kind of world. But just because it's big doesn't mean it's good. So the other reason that this is really, really personal for me is because of that experience is we didn't really accomplish a lot. And we, we advanced the science. We learned a lot of things. We asked lots of good questions. But to do what we're doing today, we are blowing out of the water the expectations around spatial resolution, around spectral resolution, around agility and repeatability. We are doing today what a team at NASA was trying to do with, at times, one person. Uh, Ethan is our intern. He's been our intern the last couple of years. Ethan can do today at any given moment if the weather cooperates and he's got the platform, do what we were trying to do 25 years ago. He can do it at the millimeter scale for RGB in addition to the hyperspectral. He can do it with LIDAR at hundreds and hundreds of points per square meter. And he can do all of that at a level of precision and repeatability and accuracy that's at the centimeter scale. Most important to me, back to my background in economics and policy, he can do it today at the cost that we were spending at NASA every single day. Every single day now is the equivalent of that turnkey solution, the hardware, the sensors, the software. So the things that we've opened up in terms of the applications of better data, to me, is so mind-blowing compared to where I started 25 years ago. So that part really gets me excited, and it's really personal. Now, the business side of it, okay, can you turn that into a business? Does that still work? Can you scale that? Are there customers? Is the market big enough? Those are some things I'll talk about today as well. But I wanted to set the context of this is something that really is amazing in terms of what we've been able to accomplish. It feels like forever, but but as we all know in these digital techniques, we're turning these things around faster and faster and faster. So, you know, I, I wanted to, to set off some of the concepts or, or or focus on some context of where we are. So what is Griffin? So Griffin really is a company that came out of Purdue University that is focused on delivering precision, precise, premium remote sensing solutions for natural resources, for agriculture. We started in plant phenomics. That's that's where our funding came from. I'll get to that in a second. But we always knew that that market was one, too small for commercial success. And two, the same tools, technologies, and techniques could really help a lot of other people. So our founders, as Dr. Uh, Tynster mentioned, these are the other founders. Uh, this is the kind of the, the slide deck that we use for commercial applications. So I don't have all the departments and such, but you've got biology, you've got electrical engineering, you've got computer engineering, you've got unmanned systems, you've got plant science, you've got civil engineering. We have a tremendous amount of multidisciplinary folks that Dr. Teinstra and team brought together to really focus on a large program around bioenergy and plant science, breeding and phenomics, which we'll get to. And today, this is our team. And we like to joke in the back of our van is we're boiler power drones, uh, except for Ethan, you are you are going to graduate this year, right? Okay. So we, you know, we everybody has a Purdue degree. We're very proud of that. Um, you know, the, if we we're lucky enough to continue to grow someday, maybe that won't be the case. But here we've got aeronautical engineering, civil engineering PhD. My background is as an ag econ at Purdue. We've got unmanned systems. So we're bringing a diverse team, a multidisciplinary team to our approach, just like the Purdue team is, did as well. But what we're trying to do is say, how, how do you operationalize that? How do you make that efficient? And how do you make it profitable? So our background came from a Department of Energy Terra program. Many of you have probably heard of this uh, program. One of the things that I point out to non-research communities, it's one of the coolest things that Congress ever did, was to actually mandate by law that through this funding, that 15% must be spent on technology to market. If we're going to invest in hard things, we want to see those technologies come down into the marketplace. How do we get that into the market? And that was my role. That's what Dr. Tynster and team brought me in for as a consultant. And then I eventually took on a more formal role. But of course, we didn't do this in a vacuum. We did this with lots of partners. We did this with uh, University of Queensland in Australia. But more importantly, one of the visionary parts of this project 
is to bring commercial folks to the table and use a term that, that, that Dr. Tenster uses to de-risk it. How do you bring people like Jay Holbert, Ag alumni who's in the room or other commercial partners in and say, hey, how, how do we position this such that you're in lockstep with us so that, yes, we're pushing the academic research envelope, but we're also learning from you of how do you translate this to the marketplace? What's valuable and what's not? And so that's important context when you think about what Griffin has been trying to do, because one of my biggest jobs is figure out what do we not want to do? What's distracting? What really doesn't help people? What will surely send us to bankruptcy faster than anything else? And the number one answer to that is trying to be all things to all people. So you've got to make hard choices. So one of the things that, that I get a lot is like, oh, you've got these big sensors and it's amazing and they're expensive and it's all this big data. And it's like, eh, you, yeah, okay, yeah, it is. It's, it's a lot of data, but but big doesn't necessarily mean good. Um, and, and so that's one of the other things that I want to talk about a little bit is in terms of what we're seeing through our customers as, as we engage them. And so this is this is clearly my worst slide in terms of, of, of letters and, and, and figures. But so decisions driven by data, is it big data or better data? And, and our answer really was, well, it, it depends. So it's a good economist answer. Uh, what's the, you know, what I wouldn't give for a, for a two-handed economist is one of the, the greatest quotes from a president around, you know, on the one hand, I see this, and on the other hand, I see this. My team sees this every day because Matt says, oh, this would be great. But on the other hand, what about this? Also part of my job to be constantly thinking about, well, how, how does this really work in the real world versus the laboratory? The second answer that we have to that is, well, it's both. Sometimes that, that big data stuff, the, the Vs, the, the volume, the veracity, the velocity, th those are really important to solving problems. But, but really, is it, is it good data? We see a lot of junk data where people are trying to spin straw into gold. And what we're saying is you don't have to always do that in some cases. Most of our customers have started to realize, and this is where I start to kind of end things, is that while I have maybe the talent and maybe the time and maybe the resources to do this myself, I'd rather allocate those resources to doing what they are supposed to do every single day. And it's a, an economic build versus buy kind of concept. So if, if I can get the best data, why don't I start with the best data and focus my time and energy on spinning that into gold rather than spinning my wheels? And so this is something we talk a lot about with customers. And our first question is always, what is your objective? Because a lot of times we find that regardless of our objective, we tend to work with the tools we already have in the tool shed. And those tools may not be the right tools for the objective. So we always start with, what are you trying to accomplish? Because we will be the first ones to tell you, we can't help you. We're afraid that we can't help you. Or this is what it would take to help you. Because in this industry of remote sensing, Thing in agriculture, especially, there's been lots of really bad broken promises that weren't realized. And we are very sensitive to that. Anytime I talk to an investor or any kind of group and they hear drone and they hear agriculture, black plague, I'm out. I don't even want to talk about this. There are so many bridges that have been burned. So we always focus on objectives and then how do we align the technology to those objectives? The second thing we do, and this really differentiates us, and this is some, one of the biggest lessons I've learned in working with our commercial partners is, second question, what are your future objectives? Okay, I understand what you want to accomplish now, and I can build you a widget for that, but what happens when that widget doesn't help you with the next problem? You just made this big investment, and I look bad, and you didn't get a big ROI on your, our investment. So that's something that I'll talk about here as we come back uh, forth. So our experience is, rather than big data or better data, most people are overweighted on more, cheap, easy, maybe available versus better. Okay, how do I get more data so I can do my analysis? Okay, wh wh what data do I have available so I can do my analysis? We find that even our advanced customers are constantly in that reactive mode of what's around me as opposed to, but what do I really want? And how do I go after that? And that's where we're starting to see a sea change. We see a lot of research activities with some of our customers. It's ugly. It's not disciplined. It's not methodical. It's not repetitive. It's the wrong tools for the job. And we're also starting to see some of that like, hey, we've been trying to do some things with these tools because they were easy and available. And I could go to Best Buy and get them. And yeah, it has some value for some things, but boy, I'm, I'm trying to do research here. And these tools aren't cutting it. The other thing we see a lot of, and this is that last, the, 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 we see a lot of paperweights. 
you know, you buy technology and then it doesn't really do anything and it just sits there, or some of us call them hurt lockers. Um, I call them a closet of shame. We have lots of customers that call us saying, hey, I spent $150,000 on these sensors. We flew it once. It never really worked and it sat in the closet. Uh, last year, I would say that 20% of our business was actually pulling things out of the closet the customers had and actually putting them to work because they didn't have the right integration, the right approach, the right tools at their disposal to leverage that investment. So that's something that's really, really important to us. But it always starts with objectives. So what was our objective at the beginning? It was around phenotyping. The Terra project was, how do you advance high throughput for genomics and phenomics to advance sorghum for a biofuel stock? Okay, great. So what are we trying to do there? Why? Well, because phenomics is really slow. It's labor intensive. It can be highly subjective. It's really expensive. Okay, so those are the whys. So what is it that we're, we're trying to achieve? Because we have, let's use some sensing tools to speed that process up, to make it more reliable, to make it more consistent, to offload some of the things like counting that many, many PhDs will do in the field for plant science. Let's also redefine expectations. So the, the world that I started in 25 years ago, of precision agriculture, the top row of getting to one meter data with multispectral and being able to, that was mind blowing at the time. We're, we're talking the plant scale. We're essentially talking about how do we achieve digital twins at the plant scale? So the why is important. The objective is important. The expectations are important. And, and so how do we define kind of what we're, we're trying to do? And then how do we do that time and time again, repeatedly? And so from a phenomics perspective, this is not a plant science talk. It, it's, it's, okay, what are we trying to do? Well, we're, we're essentially trying to take thousands and thousands and thousands of trials that are out there, we're trying to either A, eliminate the dogs that just aren't going to provide for us and get them out of the cycle faster. That saves us time, energy, money. And we're trying to identify the elite genetics that meet our purpose. But therein lies the question I want to ask. What does, that, what does that mean? In this world that's changing that we're breeding for, does that mean that it's tolerant to salinity? Does it's tolerant to heat? Does it's tolerant to moisture? Does it provide more yield? Does it provide some sort of human bent health benefit? What, what is that outcome? What is that objective that we're trying to identify to continue to really hammer on those objectives to figure out what are the tools? So in the Terra project, they were looking at all kinds of these kinds of questions that people might ask. I want to look at plant height. I want to look at disease. I want to look at yield. I want to look at kernel size. I want to look at disease. I want to predict yield. I want to predict flower. I want to do all these things. Well, each one of these objectives requires very different kinds of, of measurements, very different kinds of inputs. Some of those are physical things, like I want to count things. I want to measure things. Those are X dimensions, Y dimensions, Z dimensions. Some of these are spectral, chemical. Okay, I, I, I need different measurements for that. Some of those are truly physical in terms of pattern recognition, machine, intelli or, uh, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. So no one tool will do the job for any of these which is the whole point of how do we bring multimodality? How do we bring all these things together? Well, therein lies the problem. It's really, really hard. How do I put all these things in one environment so that I can fly them over a field, I can have that data co-aligned, I can have it repeatable and I can do analysis. And then the people who need to do those things, machine learning, spectral analysis, counting, can develop the right methods for that. That inherently requires better data, multimodal data. So it, it's big and it's also better. So, but what does better mean? And this is the thing that we've been really challenged with. Does that mean quality? Well, what is quality? Um, is it accuracy? Is it precision? Because not everybody reali realizes that they're not the same thing. Is it resolution? Is it spectral resolution? Is it spatial? Is it radiometric? Is it temporal? Is it time? Is it cost? Is it safety? Is it uh, weather conditions, what, what, what does better mean? And so one of the challenges that we continue to find is every single customer is very different, even though they might be using the same tool in terms of what are their concerns, what are their value propositions, and what drives their motivators to data collection, purchasing, analysis, et cetera. It also depends, I'm touching too many things, it also depends on, well, who's, who's asking the question? Because a popcorn grower in Indiana may have a very different question than a, a soybean grower in South America. Or I, as Griffin, may have a very different set of needs as a service provider 
than a commercial researcher? And then, and, and how does it relate to value? What drives me at the end of the day? Because especially remote sensing and all these things, there, there's always trade-offs. We don't need to go through these, you know, but it's better versus faster versus cheaper, easy versus good, scale capacity versus level of detail. Every single conversation we have with customers ultimately is about trade-offs. You want to accomplish this. Okay, are you willing to give up this to get it? There is no one perfect sensing tool. It's an ecosystem of tool. This is not the only thing that people need. They need the little one in the front of it too, because the little one is cheap. The little one is really easy to use. The little one is powerful for high quality RGB, for counting things, but it can't do half the things that the other one can do. So it it is no single approach, which is why we're always keeping that in mind in terms of those trade-offs. One of the big ones we're starting to see now with these customers though, especially in this research community, two big questions and two big trade-offs, build versus buy. When you have access to engineers and graduate students and university support and sensors, oh, we can build that. Yeah, you you probably can. Can you do it more cheaply? Can you do it more effectively? Can you do it on a better time horizon? And if you can, what did you give up when you were doing that? When that PhD was doing this, what weren't they doing in the field? Or that engineer was working on that problem. So what I were hearing from our customers is, yeah, but Matt, like you say, 25 years ago, five years ago, three years ago, these tools didn't exist. So I had no choice but to build. And now we're seeing build versus buy, both in the academic environments as well as the uh, commercial environment. So we're seeing requests now for, oh, geez, we don't want to build this. Can we just buy this? Can you just train us how to use it? We're also starting to see, and I'll come back to this later, can you just fly this for us? If you can meet our metrics on data collection, I'd rather focus my time and talent on analytics. I'd rather fo- focus on so what than data collection. And that's a new option that people are struggling with. Well, then how do I reconcile that with budgets? How do I reconcile that with my grants? So this collect versus hire is also becoming really interesting in this space. So what do I mean by this space? So we talk about phenomics and crop crop modeling, crop science, those kinds of things. You know, that's really where we got our start, but it's a really small market. We always knew that. You go to the other end of the extreme and you see drone services all the time on solar inspections, public safety, search and rescue, transportation, all kinds of amazing applications, but you can't be all things to all people. What really drives us? There's this really interesting projection that there will be more and more specific drone as a service for research. That concept of if I can have people with the right tools, the right talent, the right skill sets, and people like Ethan that can deliver the data that I need to do my research, what are the trade-offs? What are the economics of that? And the projections are that's a really big and interesting market. And so that's really where we're focusing. Yes, we do work in plant science. Yes, we work in agriculture. But our bigger focus on is uh, natural resources, forestry, larger applications of these kinds of technologies where multimodal sensing serves a lot of different purposes and provides a large return on investment. So what are we trying to do? What is a value proposition? What we have focused on after all of this work is really one, how do we take the lab to the field? The controlled environments are great, but it's really hard to scale those. So if you want to do high throughput phenomics, if you want to scale across lots of plants, lots of trees, how, how do we get <clears throat> how do we get out there and do that? So one, how do we take the lab to the field? Two, how do we make it easier to use? These are research tools, but I don't want people fumbling in the field. So when I started in this project, we started Griffin and we were transitioning in the grant. It was about three or four students that were usually around a platform to make sure that the calibration was right, to make sure that everything was connected, to make sure that they were safe and ready to fly, to make sure that the laptop was connected and they had all the right settings. And Ethan learned to do it over the course of a couple of weeks as a UAS student, and he can now collect data. We sent Ian, or Ian Ethan all over Indiana and Illinois last year, collecting lots and lots of data, one person. So it has to be consistent. It has to be relatively easy to use. Therefore, it has to be easy to troubleshoot. But at the end of the day, if you don't deliver precision quality and repeatability, it doesn't matter. It's not a research tool. So we have relentlessly chased how do we get repeatability, accuracy, precision to the highest level we can at the lowest cost point we can. 
Because we can do lots of other things, but there is no budget that's going to pay for those. So how do we find that sweet spot? And most importantly, what we're finding is the biggest valuation for our customers is that we're shortening the gap between acquisition and analysis. So if we had our base station out here and we weren't doing any post corrections and we did a 20 minute flight, within two hours, we could have processed centimeter or millimeter grade accuracy ready to go for research. Two hours. Now, normally we wait 24 hours before we do any processing, we check it, oh, no, no, no. But that is an amazing opportunity to shorten the gap between now I can do analysis. Now, most of our customers, they don't need that kind of turnaround. They maybe, maybe want to process that week. But in other situations that are more time sensitive, being able to do that is really important. So our integration philosophy is really important to all this. So we have standard offerings, a couple of standard platforms that most of our customers have, but it starts with objectives. So the first thing is, do we need to customize this for your needs today? What are your needs tomorrow? And how do we build in some future proofing and agility? Number two, platform agnostic. The drone world is changing. So our questions are, will it power it? And can it carry it legally? Other than that, we don't care what it flies. So the sensor pod that you see in below this one, this is called the Mojave system. On here, you've got a red, green, blue Sony camera where we're getting six millimeter accuracy at 44 uh, meters flight altitude. We've got an ouster lighter on here. Uh, we're getting hundreds and hundreds of points per square meter. We've got a um, headwall nano hyperspectral. We're getting hundreds of channels of information at four centimeter scale, repeatably, accurately, all co-aligned. But one, it doesn't matter what it flies on. It can go to an M600. It can go to an Alta X, which is a US made platform. It can go to the next platform that comes out next week. So platform agnostic. Number two, sensor sovereignty. Most of the systems that we see out there today, the engineering makes sense. Oh, I want to tightly couple all of this stuff. I want to put it in a box and I want to hand it to the user. But that means I'm locked into that box. I can't use that box for other things. So our designs are focused on sensor sovereignty. Every sensor operates independently. It's independently powered. The data collection is independent. The only thing it shares is a GPS signal that's coming in. So if your sensor doesn't work that day, okay, fine. You didn't lose everything. If you have to send it back to the manufacturer, does it stop you from da doing data collections? No, it just stops you from collecting that one sensor. So when we think about research investments that are people are making, traditionally you bought this complex box and when it didn't work, the whole thing went away. That's massive risk when it comes to research. So how, how do we change the mentality around how we integrate, which is one of the big reasons that we've done what we've done. And then we also build in as much flexibility as possible. So for example, the circuit board that's in here, the box that you see, um, that can handle any one of about six or seven different sensors. And it's got enough power and those kinds of things that as new sensors come along, we can change it. We are typically more limited by weight than anything else. We've got a couple of platforms for, with a pretty large co a customer that are out there that are literally ounces under the 55 pound legal limit. It's everything that we can do. It's also a $400,000 sensing plan. It's got SWIR, it's got Veneer, it's got LiDAR, it's got all kinds of stuff on it. Okay, we're pushing the envelope on what, what we can do. So we have configurations like this, then that means that that customer can say, okay, I've got some core capabilities, but maybe I don't have the budget for that right now. And I wanna add that sensor next year. Okay, now what we've done for you is we've provided you this scalable platform or this Lego, if you will, that next year, when you come back to us, you don't buy a new platform, you buy the new sensor and then you pay us to integrate it. Maybe we'll do a new calibration and you're off and running. That dramatically improves the ROI for research investments. And this one is our kind of standard unit. And then you get to the beast, again, about a $400,000 platform, tremendous amounts of data. Um, and But again, I mean, it's integrated, co-aligned, ready to go. But we're constantly changing, thinking about, okay, but what's happening in the industry? And then what do we need to do to support that? So not everybody needs a bunch of these in their ecosystem. So we'll have a lot of customers that might want one or two of these really high-end systems. Okay, but then how do I complement that with an equally good but scaled back LiDAR and RGB only system? 
So we're reinventing how we do our integrations to provide them more scalability and better improvements and better long, uh, lifetime as well. But when we deliver these things, we're also delivering them with really high quality boresight calibrations, which means you imagine you're flying over and you've got these three different sensors that are all aiming at the ground and they all have to hit the same target. So imagine it's like a boresight, like a rifle. You've got three different rifles and they all have to hit the same target. So we go through a robust calibration process. So when that leaves and goes, it goes to that customer, those are co-aligned. So that data shows up all in the same place in space and time. That means you don't have extra labor. You don't have people kind of moving that around. You're ready to go, research ready, and you're shortening that gap. So we really focused on how do we do that? How do we turn that into a service for people to do over time? We've also had other customers calibrate that or uh, uh, confirm that. So we've got a customer, the, the Korean Polar Research Institute. They did some pretty amazing tests. They're more of a civil engineering minded focus. Um, when you see that small drone, a phantom, a matrice, et cetera. Um, so they're seeing that accuracies of a range of three and a half to four and a half meters. So what they're seeing is these are the points that they measured. And that's what the imagery comes back. And then the same platform flown again now looks like this. So that means my data is moving all over the place and I have to align that data manually. I have to figure that out. But our system looks like this to the point where this customer is so obsessed with precision that they are now looking at, well, what GPS base stations all around South Korea, what is the impact? And so if I roll through these, you'll see very slight, and I mean very slight movement. Those movements are meaning they're isolating one base station all over South Korea to look at the implications of spatial accuracy. Now, if I'm looking at a tree, do I need that kind of accuracy? No, but if I'm looking at a plant, I do. And so these are the kinds of things that we're getting independently validated by our customers. Okay, so now we've sent you a robust system. We've calibrated it so that it's easy to use, it's reliable, and we're finding it to be precise and accurate, but you have changing needs out there. So how do we work with you to build flight calculators that you can figure out, how do I best match up the parameters of the camera with the environment that I'm in, the, the flight altitude, the speed rate for the cameras? How, how do we make that as versatile as possible? So if I want to fly low and slow and it's not going to bother, okay, what can I do and what can I not do? I want to fly high. What can I do? You know, again, back to these trade-offs. We also are obsessed with the realities of field work. How do you make it easier and easier to use? So one of the things that you typically do in these kinds of surveys is one, you go put out a bunch of ground control points, you measure them with the GPS, you put those points in. That is not necessary with this system. Those results that you saw in those earlier maps, there are no ground control points. Those measurements were only to measure the air. That's done because of the high-end positioning that's already on board. Okay, great. That's done. With hyperspectral, I want to take data collections that are collected in raw, and then I have to go to what's called radiance data, and then I want to convert that to reflectance data. So I know I need known panels of certain reflectance in the field to be able to do that. And we measure the points, and we do an ELM transfer, and it gives us that reflectance. Well, okay, so I've got these big, field, uh, these big tarps, and it's windy, and they're hard to use, and I need multiple people. So we've completely reinvented the operational side of this. So Ethan can walk out, take these panels, which are weighted. They have the reflectance panels in them, drop them. They're in the imagery that can be measured, zip them back up. They're clean, ready to go. And so we, everything about this process has had to be re-engineered and rethought to be as efficient as possible. So in the last, it's 2019 through 2022, I've got some metrics in here. The guys have flown over 700 flights of multimodal data like this. When you're talking about that kind of scale, everything has to be efficient. So how do we pass those lessons learned onto our customers? We now have other manufacturers that are talking to us. Actually, today, we have another one where another manufacturer said, hey, can, can you, will you just sell those panels to us? It's things like that where people are starting to realize that there's much more to the data experience. And then the software. At the end of the day, the real piece of all this was how do you take all that civil engineering, all that boresight analysis, all that remote sensing work, and how do you combine that into a relatively easy to use streamlined workflow? When we started this project at Griffin, it took 14 software interfaces, 
to go through the workflows to actually get a usable result. Now, when we talk to customers, we say that our goal is for you to not use our software. And they kind of look at you funny. Too. We want you to find the parameters that work for your solution, set up those parameters, rely on those parameters, hit go and walk away because your time is more valuable doing something else. So our software is all around. How do you streamline the workflow so that it automatically ingests the data from every single sensor? It automatically reorganizes the data so it's human readable. And if I need to go in and find something, I can. So that all the files are automatically processed and you don't open up any other software or as few software packages as possible. That saves a tremendous amount of time and it refocuses that researcher's time on what they need to be doing. And so our goal really is to, how do you streamline this process? How do you engage them and give them a true turnkey solution? So again, that two hours, the right tools, with the right methods, the right support in the field, how do you turn that data around as quickly as possible so that you can get results like this? High quality RGB, this was taken at about 20 meters. Hyperspectral in the veneer and sphere bands, we were talking about hundreds and hundreds of bands of information. LIDAR to think about the physical world like we've never thought of before. Most of us think of LIDAR and digital surface maps and maybe we've got a digital surface model of, of something like this. And we're, we're talking about Data collected 44 meters above, penetrating the corn canopy, rotating it like you're on the ground, and actually starting to think about, how do I start to map structure? How do I start to, to think of completely new methodologies for dealing with this data? And that's one of the other big lessons that we've learned, is that because we, we, we've struggled so much with remote sensing and getting that ROI, we're still using methodologies developed in the 70s on Landsat and the 80s and the research because we know they work. But now we have completely different data with completely different capabilities to the point where, okay, I, I used to map the surface and be happy with that for drainage. Now, now I'm looking at how much light penetrates the canopy and can I figure out how to predict when uh, the ground is shaded out to, to combat weeds? How do I start to, to think about virtual environments where as a researcher, I can go back and relive that plot, even though it's in the middle of winter? And, and what new and exciting things do we see that we never thought were even possible? So this is an example where we're working with a global tire manufacturer to just explore some data sets. This is not designed for this purpose. This was data that we had collected early in a season. And what we're seeing is millimeter differences in tire depressions in the field. This, this company does a lot in agriculture. They do a lot in um, mining. They were really interested in, can we start to use advanced sensing tools to look at things like tire compaction and start to provide value to our customers to figure out how do they better manage fleets? I never would have imagined that we could see data at this scale because this is way outside the stated tolerances for these kinds of data sets, but we're seeing it. So what do we do with that? And how do we make sure that we do that over time? Most of this analysis is great when you do it once, but it really has to happen over time. And if I can't align all those data sets, if I can't get that multimodality, if I can't have precision, accuracy, ease of use and reliability, then it's really gonna be painful for me downstream. And so in this case, it really has to align. So this is one row of soybeans. On the left, you see three different dates all on top of each other. So these are three completely different data collections. We didn't manage, we didn't touch the data, we just co-align them. And then in September, when the leaves drop off of soybeans, that's just one date. So you can see how well these align in space and time. Now the question is, what do I, what do, I do with this? How do I measure that? What cool anal analysis can I do? That That's the part that we're still working on, which I'll come back to. So thermal. Uh, we don't really work on thermal in our process, but thermal is super exciting. We're seeing lots of interesting things. We've done nighttime flights where we've tried to look at daytime versus nighttime differences in crop stress just to prove that one, can we do it? But there's a lot of, of software. There's a lot of engineering on the camera side that still needs to be done, but we're constantly trying to push the envelope. But we've sold multiple platforms where customers have integrated the art. We've integrated the cameras and the customers are focusing on the analysis. And that brings me to the analysis part. One of the biggest kind of weaknesses we have and was a strategic choice was that we, we really don't do analysis. We focus on delivering the highest quality data platform in the easiest way to use in the most reliable way. If we tried to focus on analysis, every single one of our customers does something different. 
we would go crazy trying to serve all people. So what we have tried to do is stay in our lane and be focused on our values, providing the best, easiest to use platform possible, and analysis will come. And we're starting to now spend our time on doing more and more of these kinds of analytical functions. The most important thing, though, is, again, coming back to this decision point as I start to wrap up, this is not a crop science tool. This is a remote sensing research tool. So if you're flying over coniferous trees, if you're flying over an orchard, if you're flying over a wetland, now the wetland's a little bit weird because LIDAR, you need special LIDAR for water, but the same principles are in place. The techniques, the approaches, they might be different. But what we've tried to do is buy, build a versatile turnkey solution so that multiple disciplines can take advantage of that. We have focused on agriculture, but this year we are starting to pivot out of that and we're starting to have many more conversations with forestry, mining, and other types of applications. So as I spin out, okay, great, but this is nice. Does it, does it really work? Um, and so what, what are our products, if you will? So we, we have the software, we have the processing tool, super important to streamlining the whole process. We obviously have the hardware, key to it all. So when a customer gets a, a box, they get a platform, a sensor pod, training, software, it's essentially ready to go. But back to that build versus buy and collect versus hire or service, we also do a lot of drone as a service for multiple companies where their data scientists just want the data. Here's our spec, here are our time targets, here are our fields, you get us the data and we'll focus on the analytics. So we've done a lot of that. So what does that mean in terms of the context of does it work? We have to eat our own dog food, as we say in the IT world. We have to use the tool we build. We have to use the software we build. We have to use the field tools that we created to be as efficient as possible. And then we have to say, well, how do we learn from our own mistakes so that we can improve outcomes for our users? So for example, uh, if you look at the last uh, 2019 to 2022, since we've been flying, 707 flights, 451 missions. So a mission, think of a mission as a field. So if it's a big field and it takes multiple flights, that's where that, that differential comes in. 28 terabytes of just raw data. So that's not processed. That's not analytics. That's nothing. Uh, last week, just to make room, I cleaned up 32 terabytes off of our NAS, off of long-term storage from the last year and a half of data that I've been working on. Flights with no complications, about 70%. This is still research. It's still hard. Don't let me make you to fool you into believing that this is a magic tool that makes the sky clear and the wind stop and the rain go away. It doesn't happen. On average, about 17% of the time uh, in terms of when we've had a problem, it's because clouds moved in. With hyperspectral imaging, that's your biggest problem. With LiDAR, ah, who cares? Go fly. But with hyperspectral, you need those clear skies. About 30% of the time, there was some issue. What does that mean? Clouds, uh, there was a sensor problem, et cetera. But if you look, most of that has to do with weather. Most of that, and so the guys work, they plan, they look at forecasts, and then they go drive three hours where the weather is different. That's the reality of field work, which is why, again, we eat our own dog food. How do we take those lessons and then try to translate those for our customers? So again, our, our mission is we're trying to build premium remote sensing solutions that's based off of Purdue IP, We've improved on that IP, we've changed that IP, we've reflected what the commercial world is asking for and in the academic world as well. We, we continue to work with our founders that are Purdue multidisciplinary scientists and have, how their research needs impact what we need to be thinking about over the future. But we're also looking at it from a, from a policy perspective, from an economics perspective, from an environmental perspective. What's, what's coming down the path that we need to be thinking about on behalf of our users? The biggest challenge that we've had from a policy perspective M600s and not being able to use them in commercial environments. And now we're selling to universities that are completely deprecating their, their DJI fleets because their state is not allowing them to have them. So those are things that we have to keep on top of to serve our customers. So with that, I, I will wrap up. I appreciate the time. Uh, again, hopefully it wasn't too much of a commercial. It was much more around like, wh why do we do the things we do? What do we focus on? Obviously it was pretty fast. Um, and I'll, I'll open it up to any, any questions you might have. Utility and platforms 
other than with drones, have you used like ground method or from airplane or used a satellite platform? What's your thoughts there? So that's super important. I, I, I am remiss that I, I didn't mention it. So the so first thing I should say is that, uh, again, much like that is not the only platform. Remote sensing is never going to be the only solution. Proximal solutions are super, super important. So ground-based solutions, whether that's a rover, whether that's on a person, like some of the uh, mobile mapping backpacks that are being used on the forestry side, that data, though, has to co-align. Uh, the same thing that's coming, even though we're doing it in the lab, one of the biggest questions I get is, what can you do below ground? Well, on, on a drone, not much. On a rover, maybe some things. But at the end of the day, if that data can't be co-aligned, how, how do you analyze, uh, analyze that? T to your question about aerial and satellite, we don't because we are focusing on that. But I would say that 50% of our customers are trying to do some form of either transfer learning or scale uh, applications where they're looking at airborne and satellites as well, especially now with the massive decrease in economic cost of launching satellites that we're seeing hyperspectral. We're seeing many, many more cameras up in space. So we're seeing a lot of that activity because, again, the idea is that I don't want 100 of those things out there. Those are expensive. How do I get 10 out there that are giving me the right techniques that I can transfer to some other data source? So we're seeing a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Hi. I appreciate the word, but I'm a little frightened by the great part. Um, we're, we're doing our best. Um, so I think two things, uh, serendipity is really important. Luck is really important. Um, but I think Purdue and others do, do a good job of trying to, to, to use tools like the Ag Accelerator, which I, I think is tomorrow morning. Is that, is that right? The, the next one is coming up. Um, the Ag Accelerator, the Foundry and those kinds of activities, uh, to, to try and bring exposure. Um, I, I think that's important. So my personal story is uh, I went to Purdue. Um, my wife uh, went to Purdue. I think my wife's family has 14 degrees from Purdue. Um, you know, so, so Purdue is important to us. I have more IU degrees, but I bleed black and gold and my IU friends can't handle that. Um, but uh, the, it was a little bit of luck, actually. I think Dr. Teinster and the team were looking at this technology to market component of the grant, trying to find somebody. And they were working with their entrepreneur in residence at the time who also worked for my wife. Um, and, at, but they were looking to do what, what I did. So that's a lot of luck. Uh, you know, there's networking involved, there's relationships involved. Um, but I think one of the, the, the most important lessons that I've learned in, in this process, and I think every university does it a little bit differently, um, I think is to always be very candid and honest about the motivators. So as a, as a professor, um, am I doing research and that's my motivator and I've come up with a really interesting tool and technique that needs to be to be built and I want to set that free into the environment and find the right people to make that successful? Or in the middle, do I want to be involved day to day, but maybe just not as the executive? Or am I the rare kind of individual that has that business and technical side who really wants to drive it? I think that's the conversation we're starting to see at different universities. So for example, I think at South Bend, they forbid the venting professors to be the CEO. They allow them to have other roles because they want that person to still be, be a professor and they want to bring in that CEO. But your question then becomes the most important one. But, but how do you find the right fit? How do you find the cultural fit? How do you find somebody with, with the skill set that, that's going to do that? I don't know that I'm that person yet. We're, we're still working on that set success from the commercial side. Um, but But it is very difficult. Um, because a lot of the times too, and I'll be very candid and honest, one of the biggest challenges I have as an entrepreneur business person is that I have eight faculty members whose job it is to publish. So they're publishing, talking about the work that I'm trying to commercialize. That inherently has friction. So you have to have the right personality to be willing to say, okay, how, how do we how do we navigate that? How, how do we protect what's university IP, what's individual IP, but at the same time maximize that potential in the marketplace? So there's definitely inherent conflict in that and finding the right people is always the hard part. Yeah. I don't even know if you remember when I said how much time am I investing in the company versus my 
faculty time share about their story, but it takes actually if my investment of time to the company before you came on board was enough for a company. I think you set up a bank account. <laughs> <laughs> You can not even have 80 hours of making a packet. It's not, and I'm, I'm motivated by scholarship. So finding someone that can actually take 80 hours of entrepreneurship into the company, and maybe 80 hours isn't even enough. I don't know. We'll have to stop. Comes and goes. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think this is the part what I mean by being honest with yourself about what your role is and what your passion is. Um, you, you are also a chair of a plant science department, which has a completely different set of expectations in terms of your workload and your ability. Whereas if, if I'm a professor and, and maybe I'm a, I'm a, a new young professor, I'm associate professor, and I've got this fantastic idea and I'm just passionate about business. Well, OK, then then the balance kind of concept is, is different. But you also now you you answer to two makers. You answer to the shareholders and the company. And you answer to the university and your department as you seek tenure and those kinds of things. That's really a lot to ask for somebody. So that that inherent challenge is, is important. And so I think being able to find the right way to be entrepreneurial as a professor, as a researcher, but find those people around you that can take the heavy load of the business stuff, the banking, the accounting, the HR. I mean, the amount of time that it just takes to run a five-person team of just the overhead part is tremendous, let alone sit back and say, what are we doing differently to advance the company? That, that's, a, that's a real challenge. Um, now, the, the other challenge inherently, though, in that is I'm, I'm not a founder. So my passion comes from my personal history, the story I told you to start. So finding somebody who's going to take that role and be passionate about the outcomes on behalf of the founder or founders in my case, it can be difficult as well. Because as a startup, typically that founder is that I'm eating ramen noodles in the basement and I'm trying to just get through and I'm going to do everything I can to make it successful. Well, when that person you've asked to do that isn't actually the, one of the founders and it's not their baby, how do you motivate them? Either emotionally, financially, um, academically, what, what what are their motivators, and how do you align it? it? It's a real challenge. So it shows you the hard work that people at the foundry, that people at incubators, the people at Dial have to go through to try and align all these moving parts. And you also have to face the harsh realities that 80, 90 percent of us are going to fail. Doesn't mean we didn't have the right product. It doesn't mean we weren't really good at what we did. Sometimes we just fail. You know, and so that is also emotionally draining for typically hard charging, really good academics who are really good at writing papers and see those and suddenly, oh, I did this thing and it, and it didn't work. And are there consequences to my academic career because it didn't work? Did, is that a black mark because I tried to do something entrepreneurial and it didn't work? Now, I think we're still as an academic society figuring out some of those expectations of how do I reward entrepreneurism in a you know, kind of uh, traditional academic tenure process, but 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 how do I also not um, kind of disincentivize uh, for for other reasons? It's it's a real challenge, and we surely don't have the model, but we've done pretty well. Yeah. Um, by the way, the accelerator course is tomorrow at noon. Tomorrow. Thank you. Ag accelerator, sorry. Gave work a lot about babysitting customers getting their stuff. Shame, God. How do you scale this up? Maybe everybody needs their individual data set. I think like a lot of work. Yeah, so I, I have, I'll try to, to keep my answers a little more brief. I have three, three answers to that. One, we don't babysit them very much. The sales cycle is slow. What do you have? What are you trying to accomplish? What are your motivators? That part's slow. But once we have it in hand and we turn it over, we typically don't meet with customers much. Uh, the, the statistics I told you about the problems, they have the same kind of problems. We work with them from time to time. Um, so the reality is we don't actually babysit them very much because 
we eat our own dog food and we have tested, 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 tested. Does it work? Does it work? Does it work? Uh, no, number two, we are very careful when it comes to the integration about only offering enough options that we can support. Every drone company I know that has failed has failed because they tried to be all things to all people, be iterated too quickly, and they ended up out there with, oh, we've got 100 drones and there are 58 different models. You can't support that. You will financially go bankrupt very, very quickly. So we try to avoid that. And we try to focus on some key principles. So when our customers come to us with problems, it's, oh, it's a positioning problem. Oh, it's a wiring problem. Okay, let's troubleshoot that over the phone. So we really have been very fortunate in not having to do much of that. Um, I, I think, therefore, scaling that um, comes in tranches. We can scale. We could probably double in sales um, without adding any more people in terms of supporting that. But the next doubling would probably take two more people. And then after that, it's pretty linear. And then it's another tranche up. So for us, it's not too too bad. Um, our software, for example, because we have fairly streamlined workflows, you're not doing a lot of software support. You're not saying, oh, well, this button doesn't work. Well, you only have 10 buttons. Send me your file. We'll look at it. Oh, this is wrong. Send it back. So we've been able to streamline that. And because I've worked around enough drone companies, they bled to death because of the very question you just asked. So we've tried to avoid those things. I see only challenges. Um, so to answer your question, we, we again, we don't really help researchers much with the analysis. We help them with making sure that they're getting the best data collected possible. And then maybe thinking through, so we've got some customers that are looking at microwave radar for moisture, that are looking at some other unique sensors that, oh, how, how might you integrate that? So we, we think about it from that perspective. Um, from the farmer side, so our, my family farms, we farm a couple thousand acres in northern Indiana. The answer is never. These tools are not built for that kind of application, at least in this context. So let me give you two answers of how, how they'll benefit and when. Um, one, they will benefit through the work of the plant breeders at commercial companies, at the universities, so that they experience the downstream value of better seed, better resistance, but faster. So if the average seed in the United States through regulatory processes, et cetera, takes six, seven years to get to market, if you can take one year off of that, that's a huge benefit to producers. So primarily they will benefit through better information from researchers, better knowledge from researchers. That's happening now. We're starting to see that. And of course, because of the breeding cycle, that, that takes time. Um, we're also starting to think things like uh, take uh, corn and this new idea of short corn. You know, okay, we've got short corn and we want to look at lodging and those kinds of things. Okay, can we use these techniques to measure and actually compare and contrast? So there'll, there'll be some benefits there. What will be really interesting uh, in terms of the timelines of other applications are things that are a little more special. So I like forage, dairy. If, if I can fly an advanced system and I can use LIDAR to look at penetration and I can get accurate biomass and I can get some uh, nutrient content and I can get density and I can get those kinds of things that, and I can provide a custom harvest in near real time and that results in better forage and less spoilage, which returns me money. That's a kind of application where I could see some of these technologies go, but more than likely they will be re-engineered to be a unique configuration specifically for that because the economics just aren't there. The only thing on that bird that is going down in price right now is LIDAR. Why is LIDAR going down? Automotive industry, autonomy. They're, it's a classic supply and demand economies of scale. When we started this project, that LIDAR that's on there would have been about $70,000. I think that one is 4,500. That's the only one though. So our total costs continue to rise. Supply chains during the pandemic killed us. That added on average about 9%. Those are starting to back off again, but, but net we're, we're not gaining ground. I would have told you when I started this project 
that we that basic platform would be a hundred thousand dollar platform, and right now it's about a hundred and forty five thousand. The costs aren't there, so the time horizon is going to be very long before producers see direct applications. But things like small sensors on combines, back to to Bruce's question, on tractors, on sprayers, like that's that's going to change, and those costs are coming down. We're starting to see some of those. So, but that's a little bit about out, out of our scope. Any other questions? Hey, how are you? Are we still recording? Uh, yeah. So as you might imagine, um, so as, as a CEO, my number one job is is to, to, to grow the company and return value to the shareholders. Um, so we are trying to do that through um, traditional organic growth first. Um, one of the biggest, and this is a great lesson in terms of entrepreneurs and in a unique opportunity. So we were a sub award uh, on the Terra contract. So we essentially received non-diluting money to figure this out. Why does Terra do that? They fund really, really hard problems that regular investors would not fund. So that that's why they do that. Um, we have made more revenue than we received in the grant, which to me is, is a huge deal. Um, doesn't mean we're profitable, doesn't mean we're rich, but it, it's a huge accomplishment, I think, in the context of how these companies usually work. Um, so because of that, I have been so conscious about the opportunity we've created with our solutions to protect that equity for our shareholders that one, we're trying to go it and see if the market will really adopt it. Um, we'll see. Uh, 2023 will be the year that we will find that out. Number two, we're working incredibly closely with partners uh, to align our skill sets with theirs. So we're partners with Velodyne, the LiDAR company, uh, almost partners with Ouster, the LiDAR company, Headball, the hyperspectral company, um, Speckum, the hyperspectral company. We're the only reseller of free fly drones in the state of Indiana. We're trying to figure out how do we align ours, uh, our skills on their coattails. And number three, sure, I'm always looking at exits. How can I be complementary to a larger company where we fill a gap that they need? There aren't many of those, but there are some. So we are constantly looking at all of those strategies to figure out how do we maximize the return for the shareholders. And one of those shareholders is Purdue University. Um, we're also trying to be brand ambassadors. We're trying to hire Purdue people. We're trying to get them out in front of other customers. So we're, we're, we take that to heart as alumni as well. So we're, we're really trying to do all of those things. Dr. Right, Einstein. Well, again, thank you all for coming to the seminar. We were going to have a couple minutes late, Matt. Thank, thank you very much. All the way from Rome. Just yesterday, so I'm glad I made it through this. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.